welcome you to our first uh, uh, joint applied physics physics colloquium of this academic year. Um, so I decided, uh, as part of the committee, to change things up a little bit and invite a physicist who's not in the physics department. Um, we have uh, our Stanford colleague Eric Dunham here today. He's from uh, the Department of Geophysics. He's an associate professor there. Eric um, received his bachelor's in physics from UVA and his PhD in physics from UCSB. He's one of our own community. Um, and uh, then he spent a few years at Harvard as a postdoc and fellow in the departments of Earth and Planetary Sciences, branching out a little bit, and, uh, and also in applied math. Um, he's, uh, along the way, he's received his Sloan and NSF career uh, awards for his research on the mechanics and physics of natural hazards, uh, employing numerical methods to study earthquakes, tsunami generation, volcano, seismology, and much else that we never want to get near, be among. Um, and today he'll talk to us about the physics of earthquakes, and let's uh, welcome Professor Eric Dunham. Start with questions. <laughs> there's, there's a bad glare on the screen, like the spotlight is shining on it. It makes it hard to see you. Uh -huh. We can go back to the other room. Is this an anomaly? Or? <laughs> Sorry, I've not taught in this room before. I think it's here or something. Ah, okay. Uh, lights. Oops, not that one. We opened a can of worms. <laughs> Worse? Better? Ooh. Too much. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me to kick off this, uh, this year's seminar series. Um, so I grew up on the East Coast. I had no exposure to earthquakes until I came to graduate school in California. Um, so for those of you in the audience in my position, I'd like to begin with, with a very short overview of what earthquakes are before we dive deeper into, into the real physics of it. Um, when you think of earthquakes, you probably think of... Um, of the ground shaking that's produced and show show you a video. Wow. Oh my gosh. Holy shit. That was gnarly. Well that was really scary. You should call your dad. I wonder if the house is okay. Oh my Yeah I kinda figured out the road was messed up and then I realized the other cars I were there too. Yeah. And then I'm looking over there and it's a, that was really that weird. was a So these are, are college students on spring break down in Baja California. Um, taken in by the majesty of, of nature's wonders. There was a strong earthquake, uh, magnitude 7.2 off in the mountains uh, to the side there. It's about the same size earthquake that occurred this summer in the Ridgecrest sequence um, here in the desert in, in California. Um, if you go back in those hills, as these geologists did, you see the cause of the strong shaking. So you see an exposure along Earth's surface where it's pretty clear there's been, been offset between the two sides of, of the fault. Um, a lot of that offset, it's working. Um, the offset can be both vertical, like you can see here, um, as well as horizontal. So here you see a stream channel that's been offset to the side. So that's the surface expression of the fault. So the shaking is caused by, by sliding across the fault. And so now let's go deeper underground um, to take a look at what's happening. So the fault surface, you're just seeing the surface trace of it, its expression there. There's actually um, a zone of weakness idealized here as a plane that drops underground. That goes down about 20 kilometers or so beneath our surface. What happens below that will actually be part of the talk that I'm going to talk about today. And an earthquake occurs as, as relative motion across the two sides of the fault. Um, that doesn't happen instantaneously. 
it takes some time. And the reason for that uh, will become clear when we think about the physics of this problem. So the sliding occurs um, in response to the gradual buildup of strain, deformation, and stresses in Earth's crust caused by the motion of tectonic plates. Um, at some point, uh, some location on the fault weakens, it loses its frictional strength, its ability to support that load, and it begins sliding. And then the earthquake happens. So imagine that we're going to take uh, the rock on, on this front face of the fault, strip it down, and look at the side view of this cross section. So this is depth now, this is the fault surface, and the colors are going to indicate how fast one side of the fault is sliding with respect to the other, or what we call the slip velocity. So the earthquake begins at some location, and then it propagates outwards. An earthquake like the one this summer, the Ridgecrest earthquake, or this magnitude 7.2 earthquake, takes about a minute to occur. The reason for that um, can be understood as follows. So sliding occurs on some part of the fault. It creates deformation, strain in the rock surrounding it. Okay? That strain is felt not just locally, but is transferred and, and occurs also in the rocks just ahead around the unbroken part of the fault or the unslipped part of the fault. So the rocks deform there. The stresses and forces acting on it are changed. And in some cases, those forces are favorable for sliding and initiate sliding there. So there's this progressive weakening and failure of the fault surface mediated by interactions through the elastic medium, the rocks surrounding the fault. So an earthquake like this ruptures um, a length of fault that can be, be up to 100 or even more kilometers long and in depth is of order 10 kilometers. So an earthquake like this takes about a minute. Where does that one minute come from? So there's a question for the grad students and postdocs. So having, what limits the speed of an earthquake? So slip occurs on one part of the fault, it's deforming those rocks, and then it's loading the rocks ahead of it. How quickly can you transmit those forces down the fault? I'm hearing it, speed of sound, right? So it's the speed of actually a slight generalization of sound, speed of elastic waves in solid. And it gets fun because there are actually multiple elastic wave speeds. Um, and so you take the elastic wave speed, ruptures go typically a little bit slower than the slower of the two waves, P and S wave. So a little bit slower than, than the S wave speed. Um, but it's a very fast, rapid, dynamic fracture process. Um, the Bay Area, of course, is no stranger to earthquake activity. Here's a map of the faults in the area, Stanford marked. Um, so the 1906 earthquake along the San Andreas Fault, uh, the 1989 Loma Prieta, just this tiny little bit there, as well as other earthquakes over in, in East Bay that have, have ruptured in, in the past hundred or so years. The other final point I want to make um, is by way of introduction is, is delving a little bit deeper into the nature of a fault zone and the loading process. A fault like the San Andreas, it's a vertical fault like this, so this is um, now looking, let's imagine that we zoom in on the fault here. And so here's the fault zone. It's a zone of weakness that's formed by a couple different processes. So um, the key thing that, that uh, I think um, leads to different deformation mechanisms as a function of depth is the change in temperature. It gets hotter by about 20 or 30 degrees per kilometer as you go down. And so the upper part of Earth's crust is brittle. It's colder. It deforms by fracture processes and then transitions when the rocks get hot enough to viscous flow um, in what we call a viscous fault route. The, um, and that's indicated here. So there are some different types of, of brittle failure processes and cracking and fracture formation at all different scales that lead to localization of deformation in these faults in the upper, let's say, 10 or 15 kilometers. And then beneath that, there's this other weakening and localization process that's the onset of viscous shearing. So you can see here, um, it, the original rock, it has grains of different minerals. They're all roughly equidimensional. And then you subject that to high temperatures, high pressures, and you start deforming it, shearing it. And you can see that some of the, the grains have been elongated. So you see this um, foliation that develops in the rocks. And that's a signature of this um, viscous flow process. It's really solid state creep via dislocations and other defects, um, either within the crystal lattice um, or, or along grain boundaries. A couple other processes contribute too. Um, the, when, subject, when this structure is subject to the tectonic loading, 
Most of the time, the upper portion of the fault remains locked. It's held in contact by frictional forces. And the deeper part, either of that frictional fault or this viscous fault root, is deforming in a relatively steady manner. So that steady deformation at depth with the upper part of the fault being locked leads to a characteristic velocity profile across the faults in their quiescent or what we call it the inner seismic state, the time period, the hundreds of years between earthquakes. So velocity profile that smoothly passes through zero, that's because the upper part of the fault is locked, and then, um, but has some offset or discontinuity in velocity across it. And so measurement um, using GPS or, or other satellite-based me methods um, can be used to map that velocity profile and then set up an inverse problem that can be, uh, in which you determine the parts of the fault that are currently locked around which strain and stresses are building up. And you can quantify potential earthquake hazard in that way. Okay, so that's the loading process. So with that introduction, here's the outline of this talk. So I'm gonna do a little bit more with um, basics of earthquake modeling, earthquake simulation. Then I'm going to delve into to three main topics in this talk. The first is focusing in the brittle upper crust, looking at the role of complex fault geometries, how that leads to additional resistance to slip beyond that offered by friction. Uh, we'll look at the earthquake energy balance and some issues there, um, and touch on why earthquakes are so difficult to predict in terms of timing. Um, the next topic is going to be delving deeper, so looking at that transition from the, the localized brittle deformation and frictional failure to uh, viscous flow in the lower crust and upper mantle. And then the final part of the talk will focus on fluids and the key role that I think they play in, in controlling fault strength. So earthquake simulations at their very basic have two ingredients, friction and elasticity. Elasticity describes the way the rocks around a fault deform. Um, if it's just as simple as elasticity, the deformations are irreversible. It's basically a bunch of springs. Um, and so we write down conservation of momentum and a constitutive law, in this case, Hooke's law. So this is just really, it's just, it is just a generalization of, of the spring idea um, describing resistance both to isotropic compression and also um, resistance to shearing motions, quantified in terms of two elastic properties. These together give you a wave equation, the elastic wave equation that has uh, waves that you'll see in, in the um, simulations to follow and which are the cause of the ground shaking that we feel during earthquakes. Um, you couple elasticity in the rocks to, uh, you couple rocks on either side of the fault obeying the elastic wave equation together with interface conditions. And that's where the friction comes in. Um, we generally assume no opening or inner penetration of the fault surfaces. And then we write a friction law where the, the shear strength or the shear resistance to sliding is just a friction coefficient times what we call the effective normal stress. So this is the difference between the compressive normal stress squeezing the walls of the fault together and pore pressure. So it's key to recognize that most of the earthquake action in an earthquake happens well below the water table. These rocks are fluid saturated. So think of them as, a, um, as rocks as having pores. There's fluid, typically water, in there, usually at a supercritical state at, at earthquake depths. Um, and that has some pressure. And so the friction is really acting between solid, solid contacts across the walls of the fault or within the shear zone in a fault. And so increasing the pore pressure can, um, can counteract some of the compressive normal stress, the sigma, that's being applied to it. So it's really the, the difference between those that's relevant in controlling friction. A lot of focus in our field has been placed on understanding friction and how friction evolves. It's not as simple as static friction, dynamic friction. Um, it's well established that friction depends on velocity and has interesting memory effects that are related to evolution of contacts along the interface. Um, I'm not gonna delve much in, into that. I will say though, point out that um, after you've gone through these transient adjustments, um, that occur with enough slip, then friction does evolve towards a steady state value and, and it's often taken to depend on velocity and it can either have um, what we call velocity weakening or velocity strengthening character. So do you have velocity strengthening means you have, uh, maybe I'll do velocity weakening, right? So velocity weakening means you have less resistance the faster you slide. And that, of course, can lead to instability like earthquakes. Um, and the transient effects come in to stabilize the system against short wavelength perturbations and lead to the concept of a nucleation length. 
That's the minimum earthquake dimension. Um, and velocity strengthening friction is, is stable. You get more resistance the faster you slide. Um, and generally we associate that with what we call aseismic slip sliding that happens so slowly it doesn't activate inertia and seismic wave radiation. Um, and generally this change in properties is a function of the rock composition and also temperature. If you add more clays or you make the, the rocks hotter, you tend to get this stable velocity strengthening behavior. Um, of course, there's a lot more to what can happen as you shear and heat a granular, fluid saturated granular material. And weakening can also occur by, by increases in pore pressure. Um, I'm not going to delve into that, although that, that was the subject of a lot of work I've done. When we solve the elastic wave equation, uh, at least in the simulations I'll show you, we use finite differences. We handle complex geometries with a coordinate transformation like this. And, uh, and so finite differences, are higher order finite differences are exceptional for wave propagation problems, which is largely the type of problem that we're dealing with. Um, there's two types of simulations I'll show you today. The first are dynamic rupture simulations. So these are simulations of a single earthquake rupture, no longer than a minute, mostly focusing on that interaction between the, the elastic waves and, and the fault and the propagation of that, that uh, slipping part of the fault, what we call the rupture. Um, and in contrast to that, we also have a, a, what's possibly a broader set of simulations called earthquake sequence simulations. These have the more ambitious aim of simulating thousands of years. Of, the, of how the system responds, both the slow tectonic loading, the nucleation of earthquakes, the rupture propagation, and then all of the aseismic slip that can happen after an earthquake or in the time between earthquakes. Um, this gets fun numerically. You have to do adaptive time stepping. You have to solve the quasi-static problem, switch to the dynamic problem during earthquakes, back and forth. Um, typically, earthquake sequence simulations are done with kind of crude approximations to inertia, so they're not quite full dynamic rupture simulations, although a lot of the work in the field is really pushing, pushing um, that boundary and really, you know, dynamic rupture simulations are really just, I think in the future, going to be just part of earthquake sequence simulations. The main advantage doing, to doing sequence simulations is that instead of prescribing initial conditions, making them up, essentially, to get some desired behavior, you know, they emerge naturally from the history, loading history of the system. So first topic here is focusing on the brittle upper crust and the role of complex geometry. So faults are not those perfectly planar, infinitesimally thin surfaces I showed you in the cartoon at the beginning. The real world is not like that. Um, this is a fault, you can go see it. It's up in the Corona Heights Park in San Francisco. It's an old quarry, so they've stripped away the front face of this, left behind this fault surface. Um, some colleagues have scanned it with um, lasers, LIDAR technology, and quantified the statistical properties of the roughness of this surface. And to a good approximation, it, it can be described as a self-similar fractal. Um, and that means that the root mean square height fluctuations measured over some length of the profile are proportional to that length. And that proportionality constant, I'll call it alpha, this amplitude to wavelength ratio of roughness. Um, so roughness of a single surface, and you can also see the slip direction, it's, it's smoother in that direction, rougher perpendicular to it. Um, roughness is not the only form of geometric complexity. These are the surface traces of uh, the Landers earthquake, also of similar size to the, the, the one this summer and then and the one I showed you at the beginning. Um, but you can see a lot of segmentation and really complex network of, um, of fault segments that get activated during an earthquake. So I'm going to focus in this part of the talk on, on surface roughness, which we idealize using fractal, fault, uh, fractal surface. Um, and so this is just an example of a realization of that with alpha of 10 to the minus 2. So it's really small scale roughness. And actually this is, this is sort of as rough as it seems to get. Um, in the real data. Incidentally, those of you who like thinking about math and, and complex systems, um, it's currently, I think, an, an unsolved problem in our field is how to describe this type of geometric complexity, the segmentation. Um, and once we have that mathematical framework, like we do for the fractal fault surfaces, I think we can make a lot of advances. But this is currently a gap in our field. So I'll show you an example of a dynamic rupture simulation. So one earthquake, artificially nucleated. Um, but left to spontaneously propagate through interaction with the wave field. Um, so this is uh, a San Andreas-like fault. It drops vertically downwards, and we're looking top-down 
on it. So this is the fault trace here. This, this green line slip is going to be an offset in that direction. And the wave field that you're seeing here is uh, the particle velocity field. So red is, is up, blue is motion downward, um, it, shown here in meters per second. Um, you can see here major wave fronts. So this is the P wave, the fastest moving wave. That's the same as the sound wave in, in a compressible ideal fluid. And here's the shear wave that comes about when you have uh, resistance to shearing motions, elastic resistance to that. The actually slipping part of the fault is just a small part here and another small part there. Those are the ruptures. So I'll play the movie now. Um, this incidentally is a simulation done in a heterogeneous medium, so there's also wave scattering, so you can see wavefront distortion. Um, this simulation we did largely to look at how complex rupture propagation can generate high frequency waves, incoherent high frequency waves, and, and figure out the relative contribution of that versus scattering along the propagation path. So that gives you an idea of, of, um, of how a rupture propagates, and you can see a lot of concentration of strong shaking um, near the leading edge of the rupture here. That's essentially it's sort of like a near field Doppler effect where you're piling up that radiation if you have a source that's propagating very close to but a little bit slower than the wave speed. Um, here's a look on the fault. So these are the fault trace, the, the, the surface roughness, but really what will be plotted on top of that is, is the slip velocity, how fast the two sides are sliding with respect to one another, and contours of, of cumulative slip, the total offset. And this is the shear over normal stress on that fault. So here's the rupture propagating out. It, that left moving rupture dies out. The right moving rupture, it's kind of complicated. There can be multiply slipping parts of the fault. Um, and it all serves to accumulate this, this cumulative locked in slip. The reason the rupture propagates is a concentration of stress that develops, an almost singular concentration of stress that develops at, at the tip of the rupture. And this is well known in, in fracture mechanics problems. The fact that you slip one part of the fault and it's locked ahead of it leads to intense straining and stresses um, at, that, at that tip. And that's what brings the fault to failure. OK, so once we have this uh, mathematical description of faults as, as fractal surfaces, then we can start um, we can do ensemble statistics. And so that's what we did here. So these are all statistically identical faults, the profile shown in red. And then we nucleated um, earthquakes on these under exactly the same loading conditions, exactly the same initial stresses, and naturally exactly the same friction. Um, so the only thing that's different is the geometry. And these are the contours of slip. And, what, and these are all earthquakes that stop naturally. They hit some unfavorable bend and arrest. And what you can see is that sometimes the earthquake gets unlucky and it's a tiny earthquake. Other times it gets really lucky and becomes a very large earthquake. What we learned from these simulations is that there's, this, there's an extreme sensitivity to very small details. It turns out to be the shortest wavelengths in, in these simulations that we can add in and resolve that are associated with the largest stresses. And those are the ones that can actually uh, um, most effectively arrest the rupture. So I think this tells you, even if you, you knew the stress state in the system, you know, you're never going to know these small short wavelength details of the fault structure that would be required to understand if an earthquake nucleates here, it's going to stop and it's going to be a magnitude 4 earthquake versus a magnitude 6 or 8 earthquake. So I think we start to get some insight into the key role that geometric complexity plays in, uh, in leading and in, in explaining the lack of predictability of events. Um, I want to delve a little bit more into some of the consequences of geometric complexity. So this is looking at the stress field. Um, this is the sigma xy, the shear stress component um, in the medium here. And so you can see, if we zoom in here around the fault, you can see highly heterogeneous stresses, right? When you slip a rough surface, and incidentally, this is all at wavelengths much, much larger than slip, so really small perturbations about that wavelength. The geometry is not changing. Um, but when you do that, you develop, you, there's geometric incompatibilities, and it's like interlocking gears. When you try to slip, you build up strains and, and resistance. Um, and so these are the stresses, those stress concentrations that are left by slip on this rough fault. So it's very heterogeneous, and, and we can describe it mathematically. So we went through a boundary perturbation analysis. We solved the problem for um, uniform sliding on a, on a flat fault and then 
did successive perturbations in, in this small parameter alpha, small dimensionless parameter. And appearing at first order as an explanation for these stress, um, the stress heterogeneity that's introduced so we get an insight into how the fractal properties of the surface are related to the fractal properties of stress. Um, each of these stress concentrations though changes the loading on additional faults. So a real fault is not just one surface. There's lots of other faults that branch and splay off of it. And the aftershock sequence that follows um, a large earthquake is largely, I think, due to these kind of stress concentrations that trigger slip on those secondary faults. Each of those faults, of course, are fractal surfaces. It goes all the way down to the 10 micron or even less grain scale. And so you can imagine this process successively repeating at increasingly smaller scales. So that's kind of how, how earthquakes work. Um, the, at second order, at order alpha squared in that boundary perturbation analysis, we came across another effect, which is an additional resistance to sliding. It's either back stress or roughness drag, but it's, it's describing really the projection of these first order stress perturbations back onto the non-planar geometry. And, you'll, and what's revealed there is that even if this fault is perfectly frictionless, there's just this geometric resistance to sliding. And we went through quantification of that effect for the roughness levels that are, are quantified by geologists. And it, I, I think, perhaps dominates on many faults um, the frictional resistance. Um, really what happens, this was all an elastic calculation, what really happens is the rock starts cracking and you develop a damage zone surrounding a fault. And that's exactly what geologists see. These faults are, are surrounded by highly broken up rocks. Um, what it tells you is that if you really want to understand this problem, it's not just an interface problem. It's really about the, the strength and um, material properties, not of the interface, but of the zone of rocks, 100 meters or more surrounding it, where all the inelastic deformation processes are occurring. And I think a lot of the strength of a fault is, is the load is borne by that, that region, not the interface itself. Um, there's interesting consequences also for the earthquake energy balance. So we can work out the earthquake energy balance. It's the usual energy balance for a solid. Here I'll take it to be the region inside the big box and outside the small box. Usually the small box is shrunk down to enclose the fault surface. And the energy flow in an earthquake, we've, the tectonic loading builds up strain energy. It's just an elastic potential energy stored in the solid. And then it converts some of that during the earthquake process to radiation, really work done by this material in the box on external material carried off by seismic waves. And energy that goes into this box region, really in, we think of it into the fault surface conventionally, where it's dissipated in friction, fra friction and fracture processes. I think there's a, it's a little bit more subtle than that. So here we did this calculation, not by bringing that inner surface to, to, or the inner boundary to the fault surface, but we kept it outside to encompass this zone of, of heterogeneous stresses. So we can calculate the energy that's been transmitted or flows into that region. So then the question is, what's the fate of that energy? Um, the customary assumption is that it's converted to heat, and that would be the case if it's sliding or, or like friction or, or if it's fracture processes. Um, but there's a longstanding issue that goes back many decades that that would produce melting that's not seen, pervasive melting of a fault, and um, thermal anomalies around faults. This is a huge amount of energy that goes in there. You can calculate the temperature perturbation and it's, it's not what's observed. So how do you get around this? Um, for a while, our field has played around with a lot of ways to reduce frictional resistance. I've contributed a bit in this area. Um, this is likely to be very small and that would be consistent with the lack of melting. And it's seen ubiquitously in, in high velocity sliding experiments. Um, I didn't get into it here, but these simulations are not elastic off the fault. They have um, plasticity, um, inelastic deformation. And so that's a, um, a dissipative process. So energy is dissipated there, converted to heat. It's a continuum description of that distributed damage. Um, it turns out the, the associated temperature rise and energy loss there is small, not enough to, well, not nearly enough to create melting. Um, this incidentally, I do think is the largest energy sink in controlling what we call fracture energy, which controls how fast the rupture propagates. So where else does the energy go? And these simulations gave us a clue. Um, associated with, so if you put the box around here, then you see that there's 
a lot of strain, a lot of stresses, and that means a lot of strain energy, stored energy associated with these highly deformed regions surrounding the fault. It's a, actually a, quite a large fraction of the total energy that flows into this fault zone region and would increase if we were able to resolve even shorter wavelength scales. I think this is, so then that brings the energy in there, it stores it in a way that at least temporarily it's not converted to heat. So the question is what, what's the fate of that energy? And then this comes back to the point I made earlier about each of these stress concentrations triggering a dip, additional earthquakes, smaller earthquakes, and then the process repeating at finer scales. Except when that happens, you can get energy out of the system through seismic radiation. And so I suspect a lot of this energy, this strain energy that's temporarily stored here, is actually flushed out of the system by radiation and then it's dissipated somewhere far away in a way that doesn't produce a lot of heating locally. Um, it's a testable hypothesis that can be examined by looking at radiation efficiency, how much of the, the, um, the, the overall strain energy that's released um, is converted into radiation, and then thinking through the, the well-known statistics of the size distribution of earthquakes. So it's something that, that our group's working on. Okay, so we learned from these simulations that ruptures are very sensitive to small-scale details. It helps make earthquakes unpredictable, unfortunately. Um, I didn't get too deep into it, but uh, I think um, the, these strain concentrations and stresses around the fault do increase resistance to sliding and probably dominate resistance on, on many faults. Um, so it's the strength of that off-fault material that, that's really controlling the system. And then there's this energy cascade to smaller scales, but I think the energy gets flushed out via radiation instead of a lot going into, into local dissipation processes. Um, okay, now I want to go deeper into the Earth and look at the system over, over longer time scales. And so here we'll transition into the second type of simulation that we do, earthquake sequence simulations. So this is, now go back to this model of a, of a vertical fault, and now we're going to take a, a vertical cross section through it, and that's shown here. So the fault is this surface, this is going to be a two-dimensional simulation, and we'll be modeling the system response in response to, uh, to slow tectonic loadings. I'm going to take the side boundaries of this system and just move them at a constant rate. And so the fault could respond just by steadily sliding at that rate, but of course it doesn't. The nature of friction is that it leads to, to uh, periodic or, or chaotic sequences of earthquakes. Um, what's key in these simulations is that this will not be done in an elastic medium. It'll, it'll be done in a viscoelastic medium. So this is now the temperature distribution as a function of depth, so it gets hotter as you go down. At some point, there's the onset of convection that, that sort of somewhat stabilizes temperature. Um, so we'll be looking at how that increasing temperature leads to viscous deformation of the rocks at depth and the nature of um, what happens when that, at the transition between friction, localized frictional sliding and viscous flow. Um, a viscoelastic simulation, we, we're solving the force balance equation, so here we'll do the quasi-static problem. Um, and then Hooke's law is somewhat similar with total strain minus viscous strain, so the difference being elastic strain. And the viscous strain obeys a uh, power law flow law. So this is a little bit like a Newtonian rheology where this, the, the stress is proportional to strain rate, except the um, eta effective is the effective viscosity, except that depends um, on stress, so the higher the stress, the, the lower the, or the, sorry, the higher the viscosity, and it also depends on temperature T here. So it's a thermally activated process, so the hotter you get, the more easy it is to flow. And that's what leads to the onset of flow at depth. Um, and so then we build in both a crust and a mantle composition, so there are lab experiments that constrain properties of, of the, the viscous flow here. So we put all that together. Oh, and incidentally, we do this with, with this rate and state friction on the fault. That's the, um, the law that can give us velocity weakening or velocity strengthening behavior, either stable aseismic creep or earth potentially unstable behavior. Okay, so we'll start with a, basically a reference simulation, very classic model going back to the 1980s or so, where the, and so this is shown, these are, this is showing slip contours. So in response to that steady loading of the sides, this bottom part of the fault slides at a steady rate. 
and well, the upper part remains locked. So these are contours of slip. Blue is plotted every 10 years. So that equal spacing shows you motion at a steady rate. So the bottom part of the fault is sliding. Top part is locked. That builds up strains and stresses here, causes an earthquake to nucleate. And the red lines are plotted every one second during the earthquake. So what you see is a sequence of earthquakes in this simulation for certain reasons. They're, they're perfectly periodic. So this is an example of, of a simulation that's run for thousands of years and creates multiple earthquakes. Um, in contrast, this is a model with when we have, um, when we do it in a viscoelastic medium. So now you can see that fault slip shuts off below some depth. Looks to be around 20 something kilometers here. And that's because instead of having localized frictional deformation, it turns out to be easier to just flow the rocks around the fault. And so what's plotted in this right panel is the viscous strain. So this is the fault here, and the colors here are showing um, the viscous deformation. So you can see it occurs in a region a couple kilometers wide surrounding the fault, and it broadens substantially with depth. Okay, so that's what's happening at, at depth here. Um, there is this intervening region in this simulation where the fault is creeping aseismically, so it's still frictional deformation, uh, but it's fairly steady, so that's some intermittency here, but, but it's not really participating in earthquakes. So here the earthquake depth is controlled by that frictional transition. Um, incidentally, the, the depth at which you have the so-called brittle deductal transition, the onset of viscous flow, is controlled by the geotherm, and there are different regions due to different tectonic regions that have higher heat flow. Um, you know, it gets hotter, faster with depth than other regions here. Um, and so that can move that boundary up and down. And there are constraints on, on that so-called geotherm from measurements of the surface heat flux. The thing that we'll do here next is, is to think about the creation of a thermal anomaly. So if you have frictional sliding, you generate heat. If you have viscous flow of a material, it's a dissipative process, there's generation of heat. So what we'll do is we'll couple this together with the energy equation. So this is conservation of energy plus Fourier's law. So it's assuming conductive heat transport. We get a diffusion equation for temperature and it, with a couple source terms. So in the crust, there's radioactive elements that undergo decay, that produce heat. Um, but in addition, the, and the key points I want to focus on here is both viscous flow and frictional heating generate heat. It's, a, it's an energy sink. Of course, there's coupling here. Through the shear heating, we increase temperature locally relative to that geotherm. That feeds back in. It decreases effective viscosity, makes it easier for the rocks to flow. So that's a thermomechanical coupling that, that we explored in these simulations. Um, it's a fun challenge because the thermal diffusivity is pretty small. We're modeling the system over earthquake time scales as well, which are seconds. And the diffusion length over one second is about a millimeter. So you have to have grids that can resolve that type of scale at the same time resolving the whole tens of kilometers tectonic scale and doing all the, the time stepping. So um, Callie Allison, former student, did that. Uh, so this is a zoom in of, of the heating, the temperature and thermal anomaly that's created one day, one week, one month, and one year after an earthquake. And this is over the, the much longer time period between earthquakes. This is all zoomed in at a 10 meter scale. So you can really see that boundary layer, the thermal boundary layer that's created by, by heating during the earthquake, and then the subsequent diffusion outwards or conduction of that heat. And then it establishes this profile um, now at a 30 kilometer scale where most of the heating is happening down in, in the lower crust where friction, frictional contributions are larger because the compressive stress is larger. Um, and this is a plot of, of that effective viscosity. So it, it varies over many, many orders of magnitude. Um, the main effect of the shear heating is that it, it reduces the effective viscosity in this region. Um, this is plotting the, the shear stress acting on the fault and its, its deep root. And the blue simulation is without shear heating. When you add shear heating, it really weakens material in, in between 20 and 30, or really 20 and 40 kilometers depth. Um, and that pushes this brittle ductal transition up and limits until it's now the process that's limiting rupture depth. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this is probably how um, real earthquakes work, that it is this, this brittle ductal transition that's, that's limiting earthquake depth. Um, and it also changes the nature of loading how a distributed viscous flow 
can load that upper, upper seismogenic zone. You can see that reflected in a change in the size of the earthquakes. These, have, these are bigger and they happen to be less frequent earthquakes. Um, incidentally, if you stare closely at this and this, you can see that there's a couple kilometers where you get both where the tectonic motion is accommodated both by distributed viscous flow and slip on the fault. So this region participates both in the earthquake rupture process and it participates in distributed viscous flow. And that's exactly what many geologists have documented. They're cross-cutting brittle and ductile features. You'll see elongated grains stretched out and then a fracture passing right through it. Elongated grains fracture. Um, that indicates that these are happening over the earthquake time scale. And also part of what contributes to this, the way that you can take a rock and deform it ductally and then brittily is that there's a dependence on stress or really on strain rate. You can see this in silly putty, right? If you pull it really fast, it behaves brittily and breaks. If you deform it more slowly, like the system's being loaded in the time period between earthquakes, it can flow. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Okay, so we see this overprinting of both brittle and ductile deformation, at least in some cases, um, that I think is consistent with uh, earthquakes being, earthquake depth being controlled by that onset of viscous flow, and it's consistent with the geology. Um, shear heating, of course, provides an important feedback that helps localize viscous flow, and we're thinking now, I haven't talked at all about validation, but you can, I think, these types of simulations open the link to geology, there are good constraints on the width of these viscous shear zones, um, the temperatures, the grain size, and, and so on. Um, and then, of course, there's what can be measured on our surface is the deformation, uh, which is a signature of the, the, both the transient and relatively steady viscous flow that happens at depth. Okay, so these simulations, like most in our field, assume a priori some distribution of both compressive normal stress and pore pressure with depth. The standard assumption is to take that compressive stress to be about equal to density of rock times G times depth and take pressure to be hydrostatic water density times G times depth. Um, but as I'll try to convince you I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics of pore pressure. So I'll focus on two large plate boundary faults here. On the left, the San Andreas, and, the Alp, and on the right, the Alpine faults, like the San Andreas, um, but down in New Zealand. So these are uh, major boundaries between tectonic plates, and these are horizontal cross sections, uh, or sorry, vertical cross sections that are dropped down. And both of these faults are known to act as barriers to fluid flow. The highly broken up rock in the middle, it, it's very low porosity, very low permeability. That acts as barriers to fluid flow. And there's evidence from geochemistry um, that suggests that fluids are coming up along the San Andreas Fault. And it's, it, these are measured in, in springs that come out at the surface. Um, this is derived from dehydration reactions at depth. Um, a long story about where, why, and where, and why in this location that I won't get into. Um, the Alpine Fault in New Zealand, it's mostly, the fluids on the fault are mostly meteoric water, so just rainfall. Some small fraction of that gets down to, to um, that brittle ductile transition and then um, comes up and is channeled upwards along the fault. So the fault acts as a guide for fluids. So what happens when you have ascending flow along a fault? Well, incidentally, just to give you a sense of how much fluids are involved here, uh, the fluxes range between 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 7 meters per second. That's basically a cubic meter of water being transported per meter square surface area every year. It's about, about in that ballpark. So it's not a lot of water, but you'll see it has big consequences. Um, so we idealize the system in this way. So now we'll take a, a, a side view, slice through the fault. It's a fault zone, that damage zone of broken up rock, it's high permeability. So most of the fluids are assumed to travel through that. And in this idealization, I'll, I'll treat the rock on either side as being impermeable. So we have a, a we do a standard porous flow for this. Um, and we end up with a diffusion equation for pore pressure. So it's really conservation of fluid mass 
introducing some relation between pore pressure and density and, and porosity. And then Darcy's law, it's basically Fourier's law, pressure or uh, fluid flows in the direction of, of the pressure gradient minus the weight. Um, so the coefficients in that are the permeability and the viscosity of the fluid. So permeability is a big one that I'll focus on. And of course, pore pressure is so important, as I mentioned earlier, because it controls fault strength through friction, the, through the effect of stress and friction. So upwards flow, it's pretty easy to see, would generate overpressure, which is pore pressure is in excess of hydrostatic. Here's one way to see it. So we could take Darcy's law, fluid flux, written in terms of pressure gradient and, uh, and the weight of the fluid, and then treat Q as constant, treat permeability, viscosity as constant, just integrate this. And you get a pressure distribution that's the hydrostatic plus some overpressure, and that increases as, as, you, as you increase that, that flow rate. Okay, so fluids can be highly overpressured if you have enough flow. It's just the viscous pressure drop um, that's required to push them up that, that leads to that. So there are a couple processes that make this a lot more interesting than the steady state model would suggest. Uh, a well-known geologist, Rick Sibson, has, has postulated from geologic evidence what, what's called fault valving behavior. Um, so he envisions uh, regions in Earth's crust as, as being impermeable during the time period between earthquakes. There are many chemical processes, deposition of minerals that can seal off porosity and permeability, lead, make it more impermeable. Then ascending fluids would pond, pressurize, that could weaken the fault and trigger an earthquake. And then now that's the opening of a, the fault valve and then the fluids can discharge upwards through that now, now ruptured barrier. So the two processes we want to include would be a permeability decrease from healing and sealing processes and some permeability increase due to cracking or, or dilatancy, sort of uh, volumetric changes during sliding. Um, this was a cartoon and our goal was to transform this into a quantitative model. Um, so we introduced some very ad hoc, but I think minimally, minimally parameterized permeability evolution models. Um, we have permeability evolving with slip L via slip velocity. So V times L is slip, or sorry, V times T is slip. Um, so permeability evolves towards a maximum value over some slip distance L. And then it also evolves towards some minimum value over some time scale T. Reality is a lot more complicated than this, but this serves to get us started. So we'll take this, this healing time to be of order a couple decades. There's some constraints on that. Um, and then we'll put this slip evolution distance to be around a meter smaller than, than would occur in a typical earthquake. And then the other key effect here is that as you squeeze rocks, they become, uh, the permeability decreases. So we make it dependent on effective stress in this manner. Um, and so you can see how the permeability changes as a function of that effective stress. And then the, the top evolution law takes you, evolves you between these different curves. <coughs> so we put all this together for steady flow and we get um, a distribution of pore pressure. So this is as a function of depth, a couple different things. We get permeability that decreases with depth. Um, the normal stress on the faults, just linear with depth, but the pore pressure increases as this blue line, it starts out hydrostatic and then it starts tracking lithostatic as the pores seal up at, at depth and there's a lot more resistance. That leads to this effective stress being independent of depth, something that was noted a couple decades ago. So that, we're going to use that um, in a reference simulation and compare it to what happens when we turn on the permeability evolution dynamics. Um, so we do that in an earthquake sequence simulation. For simplicity, this is in an elastic solid. We're going to have those ascending fluids. We're just going to feed it with a constant fluid source at depth and set pore pressure to be atmospheric or zero at the top. Um, so these are the earthquakes that result when you have that reference simulation, the fixed effective stress. So you just get this periodic sequence of earthquakes rupturing the, the upper part of the crust. And this is depth and time. This is plotting slip velocity in a log scale. So you see that the upper part of the fault, the one that had the earthquake, is basically locked very, very low slip rates during most of the time between earthquakes. The earthquake is really just a, a vertical line here, while the bottom part of the fault is creeping. In contrast, here's what happens when you turn on those permeability evolution dynamics. Um, for certain reasons, you get more frequent, smaller earthquakes, but the main thing to see is that all the action that's happening down here at the bottom, the fault is really unlocking. So the, the 
steady, fairly steady aseismic slip at depth is infiltrating upwards into that locked seismogenic zone and it does it for decades prior to triggering the large earthquake. So what's happening here? So we can look at um, permeability, snapshots of permeability versus depth and effective stress versus depth. And so here we'll start with the earthquake. So plotted every two seconds, these, this is the permeability being increased. It moves from the left to the right and leaves the fault zone in this high permeability state. The fluids have pressurized in the time leading up to the earthquake, creating this distribution of effective stress. It's weak. The earthquake is triggered, that increases permeability, and then those fluids are discharged out the top and leads to a depressurization of this whole seismogenic zone. Okay, so that's the depressurization that happens over a few decades until the fault heals. And then the ascending fluids now hit um, the low permeability, so the healing is the blue curves that trace back to the left here. And then the ascending fluids push in from below, they start pressurizing, and they weaken the fault. So you can see that pressurization as these ascending fronts here. When they pressurize, they weaken the fault, they trigger slip, that slip on the fault dilates the material a little bit, it increases permeability, that's what you're seeing here, and that feeds back on itself. So you get this, the fluids are, are sort of pushing up and that um, and triggering a seismic slip, then that dilates the material, and so on, the process continues. So it's really fluid-driven a seismic slip. Leads to um, ascent of this locking depth, what we call the locking depth, at a rate of about 150 meters per year, which turns out to be consistent with what's being seen in, currently in Cascadia. Um, this is a subduction zone uh, west of Seattle. So there, apparently that some of the analysis of the geodetic data is consistent with that locking depth being pushed upwards at a rate of between 30 and 120 meters per year. So not, not too different than what we're seeing in these simulations. So I think it's a real thing. Um, all right, so let me wrap up here and conclude. We talked about a couple topics, the role of geometric complexity in the brittle crust, the transition to viscous flow at depth, and then what I think is, is, is really a, sort of new frontier for our field is, is looking at the role of, of fluid transport, poor pressure evolution, the coupling with fault slip. These have all been separate research topics, but the plan, of course, is to bring it together. Um, if you want to learn more, and there's a, a nice white paper that we put together uh, summarizing the field and suggesting future directions, so you can take a look at that. And also point out for the students in the audience, in geophysics we offer a couple classes if you wanted to dive deeper in, into this continuum mechanics type analysis of the Earth. Um, in the winter, I teach a, a mixed advanced undergrad grad class called Ice, Water, Fire. It's really an introduction to continuum mechanics. We go through a lot of different systems and just work out the basic mechanics. How do you translate conceptual ideas on how the system works into mathematical equations? And then you see what the implications are. There's a lot of scaling analysis and other things that you would do in physics. Um, and then for, for undergrads, just starting, you know, exploring geophysics, we offer um, Geophysics 110, which is a survey of geophysical measurement techniques and, and how it's applied across many systems in the Earth. All right, so with that all, thank you, and uh, take your questions. It's probably important to distinguish between what's seen at the surface, where you have sediments and other materials that are subject to a lot less confining stress than at depth. So it's likely that that complexity diminishes as a function of depth. What the real complexity down there looks like it's still somewhat unclear. Um, a lot of these earthquakes, I mean, faults do grow and evolve over geologic timescales, and it's probably ruptures that, that stop, create some set of tensile fractures that then get later reactivated and shear. I don't know if it's that well understood, and it's certainly not something that's been well incorporated in, in simulations. How do you know where that point 
part of your point is like what do you what how do you know what slips first along the fall? Um, and then my second question is in your simulations, have those been validated, like looking at actual earthquakes? Um, you know, are you able to see like are there parameters that you're able to pick up from your simulations that you can see in actual mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so when doing a dynamic rupture simulation of just one earthquake, you as a modeler decide where you're going to initiate slip. So we're doing dynamic rupture simulations for a reason. So for example, I'll, I'll explain one application with it to partially address your second question. So validation. So often we'll do a dynamic rupture simulation of a real earthquake that occurred. And in that case, there are, there are seismic constraints on where the earthquake nucleated, and so we'll initiate the rupture at that process. The reason that we would model a particular earthquake is that there are certain parameters that we don't know. We don't know friction coefficients. We don't know the distribution of effective stress. And so those can become model parameters that are determined as part of um, an optimization process where you try to have model predictions become more consistent with data. And so for instance, we've done that with the uh, 2011 Tohoku earthquake, the, the great subduction zone earthquake, trying to match seafloor geodesy, you know, uh, seafloor displacement measurements. And we did that by adjusting the effective stress distribution on the fault and found it was actually pretty low in a way that suggests and argues for, for needing to have high effective stress, high, or sorry, high pore pressure. Um, so that gives you an example. We also compared to ground motions, the rough fault simulations, um, predict ground shaking, especially incoherent high frequency shaking that's very consistent with with real ground motions. Yes. <coughs> so can your pore pressure formalism be used to investigate the consequences of fracking? Yes, and some of the big mysteries in hydraulic fracturing would be observations of rapid pressure communication over pretty large distances. Some of the rocks are fairly impermeable and take you know, the estimated diffusion times across that distance are large, um, larger than, than would be seen. Uh, so there's possible role of, of aseismic slip in that process. Another contributor would be the fact that these damage zones around faults are a lot higher permeability and can act as guides for pressure transmission. So absolutely, and, and in fact, I have a student who's, who's starting to, to move her work in that direction. Okay, last question. You were talking about the porosity at the fault changing. Do you ever get water actually coming up out of the fault? You get water coming up um, around faults for a couple reasons. I, I was not here during the Loma Prieta earthquake in 89, but evidently a lot of springs turned on or turned off following that earthquake as a function of um, that possibly might be local change, you know, strains around whatever aquifer is, is sourcing that. Um, I think, you know, the pictures I showed you of fault zone flow, as it gets up into the, to the very shallow part, may likely branch off, and then the water can take different pathways up to some hot springs here, some other out source. I don't know of examples where a fault zone itself, you know, defined as some narrow region, suddenly spurts. Fluid. And the fluxes, anyways, that we're talking about are, are really quite small. Okay, let's thank Eric. Yeah, thank you.